so I'll make it short, so. Okay. Are we live, Millie? Yep. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Monty Hart Lecture Series. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have today Dr. Stefano Figliosi, uh, who will be speaking about the mitral annular disjunction, how we image it, and if it's a risk marker or sudden cardiac death or a benign condition. Dr. Figliosi works as a cardiologist at the Humanitas Research Hospital in Milano, Italy. He did his training initially in Palo in Italy and then performed a, a fellowship in research at King's College in London. And he's published some really nice papers on the topic. So it's a, it's a great honor to have you here today. Thank you for joining us. Thanks a lot, uh, Leandro. Uh, I'm really thankful for your uh, invitation and I'm thrilled to be with you today. So let's start and let's try to answer to this question. If we are imaging the mitral annulus disjunction, are we imaging a risk marker of sudden cardiac death or are we imaging a benign condition? Let me start with the story and let me introduce you to Mary. Mary was a 20-year-old asymptomatic woman with no family history of sudden cardiac death or cardiomyopathies. She had a cardiac arrest and after 26 minutes of CRP, an erogation of DC shock on ventricular fibrillation made a repristination of the spontaneous circulation and the patient was transported to our hospital. We perform the ECG and uh, as you can see, we have a widespread repolarization abnormalities in the inferolateral leads and we also have AQT prolongation. At the ECG monitoring, we also found frequent ventricular ectopic beats with a right bundle branch block morphology. And then we performed the transthoracic echocardiography, which revealed this abnormal motion of the mitral annulus with a paradoxical expansion during systole, that is the so-called systolic curling. We also found a mild mitral regurgitation. Thank you, Leandro. And the mechanism of the mitral regurgitation was a leaflet, classic mitral valve prolapse. Thank you. We then performed the CMR and the CMR uh, uh, confirmed the echocardiographic findings. You can see here the systolic curling and the leaflet mitral valve prolapse, but uh, we also see the presence of this uh, anatomical abnormality, again, that is a separation during systole between the most basal part of the left ventricle and the junction between the mitral leaflet and the left atrium. And this is the main topic of our presentation of today. It is the mitral annulus disjunction. CMR was completed with a tissue characterization that excluded myocardial inflammation. but revealed the evidence of uh, uh, posterior myocardial fibrosis as spotted by increased values of native T1 mapping and mid-wall late gadolinium enhancement in the same site. Okay. Okay. Okay, so overall mitral annulus disjunction and mitral valve prolapse were the only cardiovascular abnormalities associated with this case of aborted sudden cardiac death. And so this case is one case of a rhythmic malignant mitral valve prolapse. Mitral valve prolapse is the most common valvular heart disease in the general population. However, there is a, a minority of patients that are exposed to sudden cardiac death, 
and uh, uh, four out of five cases of sudden cardiac death related to mitral valve prolapse occur in patients with moderate or less than moderate mitral regurgitation. And if uh, we go back to the 1980s, uh, we can find the first description of mitral annulus disjunction in a clinical context that is very similar to the one that I just shared with you now. It was uh, a victim of sudden cardiac death with a history of palpitation and evidence of a mid-systolic leak uh, during uh, systole. So the pathologist found a floppy mitral valve and this uh, abnormal elongation of the mitral annulus, which accounted for a separation between the most basal part of the left ventricle and the junction between the posterior mitral leaflet and the left atrium, just similarly to what we saw in our case. But five years later, so there was the first systematic uh, search of mitral annulus disjunction uh, in a wide court uh, of individuals. This study from the Johns Hopkins group revealed uh, a very high relationship between the mitral annulus disjunction and the floppy mitral valve, because 23 out of 25 cases of floppy mitral valve showed a coexistent mitral annulus disjunction. In contrast, the prevalence of this condition dropped from 92% to 5% in patients without a floppy mitral valve. And the authors also observed that isolated mitral annulus disjunction patients were younger than patients with a mitral valve prolapse. And so the authors tried to figure it out what could be the consequence in a heart in vivo of an abnormality of the uh, mitral annulus. And so the authors were actually brilliant because uh, they figured it out that this uh, anatomical abnormality had a, a functional counterpart because uh, if uh, the left ventricular contracts during systole, the higher pressure in the ventricle are responsible for a paradoxical enlargement of the annulus. And this paradoxical enlargement of the annulus leads to a displacement of the posterior mitral leaflet that will be subject to higher systolic pressures than normal hearts. Based on these findings, the authors postulated that mitral annulus disjunction could be a primum movens of a cascade in which the stretching of the annulus, that is the systolic curling, is responsible for a hypermobility of the mitral valve apparatus, and so for a mitral valve leaflet traction. And this traction, if repeated in cardiac cycles for years, could lead to a myxomatous degeneration and to the development of a mitral valve prolapse. And this postulate was supported that by the fact that younger patients ex exhibited isolated mitral annulus disjunction and older patients showed mitral valve prolapse. So since from the beginning, mitral annulus disjunction and mitral valve prolapse appear to uh, share a common spectrum. And now let me uh, put your attention on this slide regarding the common spectrum of mitral annulus disjunction and mitral valve prolapse. I don't think that many of you could find many things in common between a Cavalier King Charles Spaniel and a patient with a Marfa syndrome. However, they are more similar one to each other than they appear at first impression. They have the same diseases, musculoskeletal diseases and eye diseases, because they have a connective tissue disorders and they also have a very high prevalence of mitral valve prolapse that is the highest prevalence for dogs and for human beings. And so we are not surprised that the prevalence of mitral annulus disjunction in this population is really high. And the more severe is the connective tissue disorders, like in patients with the pectus excavatum, the more prevalent will be the mitral valve prolapse and the mitral annulus disjunction. And with the advent of uh, cardiovascular imaging, we have confirmed the findings of the pathologist of the 1980s. 
you can find here the anatomical abnormality that is the mitral annulus disjunction during systole and the, and the functional abnormality that is the systolic curling, that is this high permobility of the mitral valve apparatus during systole because of the disjunction. But the consequences of mitral annulus disjunction may not be only related to the mitral valve, because from the other side of the mitral annulus, we have the left ventricle. And the left ventricle is the dark side of the mitral annulus disjunction because it, it is subject to traction forces, especially the myocardial wall, the posterior myocardial wall, and papillary muscles are the sites that are most subject to increased uh, traction forces uh, secondary to mitral annulus disjunction. And this is important because uh, uh, the effects of left ventricular traction may reflect in the mechanical induction of ventricular arrhythmias that we know that are typically right bundle branch block uh, morphology ventricular ectopic beats and we know that Purkinje fibers that are partially located inside the papillary muscles are involved in the genesis of ventricular arrhythmias in these patients. And so we are not surprised that the higher is the extent of the mitral annulus disjunction, the higher will be the burden of ventricular arrhythmias in patients with mitral valve prolapse. But the traction forces on the left ventricle are also uh, important because they can uh, lead to a real development of myocardial fibrosis through mechanosensing of cardiac fibroblast by inducing a suppression of primary cilia and activation of profibrotic genes and molecules, such as transforming growth factor beta. And so, again, we are not surprised to appreciate that the higher is the extent of the mitral annulus disjunction, the higher will be the traction on this uh, left ventricle, and the higher will be the extent of myocardial fibrosis. And myocardial fibrosis is important in patients with mitral valve prolapse because uh, the study group of Padua uh, with Professor Basso, Iliceto, and Perazzolo Marra showed that all patients in their casistic with a sudden cardiac death related to mitral valve prolapse showed some degree of myocardial fibrosis in the sites that are most subject to the mechanical stretch because of the mitral annulus disjunction. And we also know that uh, with CMR, we can detect uh, myocardial fibrosis in vivo. And we uh, and uh, other study groups uh, have confirmed the presence of myocardial fibrosis in the sites that are most subject to the systolic stretch. And uh, this late gadolinium enhancement has been associated with the origin of ventricular ectopic beats, according to the analysis of 12 lead ECG morphology. And we also demonstrated that uh, patients with uh, mitral valve prolapse without comorbidities, without cardiovascular diseases, and without uh, mitral regurgitation or left ventricular dysfunction, if those patients show late gadolinium enhancement at baseline CMR, they are exposed to a fourfold increased risk of experiencing the sudden cardiac death or sustained ventricular tachycardia or unexplained syncope at more than three years follow up. But mitral annulus disjunction extent is not the only factor inducing left ventricular traction. We have in this context many other features that can contribute to this abnormality. And I draw your attention on this very recent finding in which the study group of Maura Ferreira and co-authors show that an apical displacement of the papillary muscle is an important factor because it accounts for a higher stress to the uh, left ventricular structures and has been associated with myocardial fibrosis and ventricular arrhythmias. And because uh, all of this, uh, this uh, abnormal motion has been also suggested to be named as the dance of the death. So uh, this uh, is a hypothesis to resume the malignant role of mitral annulus disjunction that is the primum moments not only for the development of mitral valve prolapse, but also uh, for inducing uh, uh, mechanical stretch 
of the myocardial wall and of the papillary muscles together uh, with the mitral valve prolapse. And these structures forces reflect uh, in the development of myocardial fibrosis and ventricular arrhythmias that are respectively the substrate and the trigger for uh, sudden cardiac death in these patients. And there are uh, evidences supporting this uh, malignant uh, uh, mitral uh, annulus disjunction present, such as uh, this study showing an association between uh, the presence of mitral annulus disjunction and myocardial fibrosis and premature mortality. But there is also this uh, other finding in which uh, mitral annulus disjunction, but not mitral valve prolapse, resulted to be the imaging markers associated with ventricular arrhythmias in patients with Marfan syndrome. Importantly, mitral annulus disjunction extent was an important factor for uh, malignant ventricular arrhythmias, and uh, all patients experiencing the sudden cardiac death showed an extent of mitral annulus disjunction of at least 10 millimeters. We also have this important study from the study group of Oslo, in which uh, uh, selecting uh, 126 patients based on the finding of a mitral annulus disjunction at echocardiography, the authors found that uh, it was a mitral annulus disjunction independently from mitral valve prolapse to lead uh, the higher prevalence of ventricular arrhythmias in these patients. But uh, this is a population that is uh, not uh, um, cor that is not uh, cor that uh, does not correspond to the general population because of a very high incidence of uh, malignant ventricular arrhythmias. And so these studies uh, supporting a malignant role for the presence of mitral annulus disjunction have limitations in terms of a cross-sectional uh, shape of the study and in terms of uh, selection bias uh, of patients. And so let's have a look at what does it happen when we test uh, the prognostic significant of significance of mitral annulus disjunction. We have this study from the Mayo Clinic group showing that uh, patients with mitral valve prolapse and mitral annulus disjunction are not exposed to an increased risk of mortality at a 10 year follow up compared to patients without uh, a mitral annulus disjunction. However, the authors found uh, an association between uh, the mitral annulus disjunction and the combined arrhythmic point. But curiously, this association persisted after mitral surgery and so after the resolution of mitral annulus disjunction. So we may hypothesize that other features are implicated in this uh, combined arrhythmic point that are not subject to correction after mitral surgery. And certainly fibrosis can be one important factor that is not reversible after mitral valve surgery and leads the prognosis of these patients. Accordingly, we found that late gadolinium enhancement presence, but not mitral annulus disjunction presence, was associated with arrhythmic outcomes in these patients. And let's have a look at what uh, does it happen when we uh, search mitral annulus disjunction in unselected course of patients. We found that this condition is not so rare. You can see this uh, very high uh, number uh, um, study population study uh, from an echocardiographic lab in Japan. There is a, a 9% prevalence of mitral annulus disjunction in the general population. This uh, very high prevalence is unlikely to represent, uh, because of this uh, very high prevalence, mitral annulus disjunction is unlikely to re represent, per se, a risk marker of sudden cardiac death. And this prevalence uh, uh, all increases with uh, um, other imaging modalities with uh, higher spatial uh, resolutions, such as uh, CT, which uh, can find the mitral annulus disjunction in 96% of patients, or CMR, that, find, um, that finds mitral annulus disjunction in 76% of UK biobank subjects. Importantly, this uh, uh, mitral annulus disjunction uh, were characterized by a very limited extent. You can see a medium, uh, medium or mean uh, extent of the disjunction of uh, two, three millimeters. <laughs> 
And another factor uh, that does not support uh, a malignant role for mitral annulus disjunction is that uh, the presence of the tricuspid annulus disjunction has not been associated with the ventricular arrhythmias. Overall, ventricular arrhythmias and ventricular arrhythmias for the right ventricle were not more frequent in patients with a tricuspid annulus disjunction compared to patients without a tricuspid annulus disjunction. So uh, we really don't know, uh, according to these uh, uh, features, is uh, the presence of mitral annulus disjunction is uh, a malignant or a benign condition. And let's try to deal with the, the uh, methodological and uh, um, technical issues that may at least partially account for these discrepancies that are present in the literature. We already mentioned the uh, study population selection bias, but we really have uh, important uh, methodological issues in uh, um, detection of mitral annulus disjunction and mitral valve prolapse that may impact on the prevalence of these two conditions and finally on the clinical significance. So the first thing to keep in mind, in mind is that mitral valve prolapse has to be uh, adjudicated only in the three-chamber view because uh, this view allows uh, for cutting the highest point of uh, the saddle shape of the mitral annulus. And uh, if uh, we look uh, uh, mitral annulus, uh, mitral valve prolapse in other uh, long axis views, we are prone to the detection of false positive mitral valve prolapses. The second issue is uh, what uh, uh, do we want to do if uh, considering the extent of the disjunction within the assessment of the mitral valve prolapse or outside the assessment of mitral valve prolapse. This uh, uh, thing is not negligible because it has practical consequences. For instance, if you see th these two these patients this patient, this patient can be categorized as a mitral valve prolapse negative patient if we take the mitral annulus disjunction extent outside of the mitral valve prolapse assessment. But in contrast, if we consider the mitral annulus disjunction extent inside the assessment of the prolapse, this patient will be categorized as a patient with mitral valve prolapse. But another issue is uh, the impact of the imaging method methodologies and, uh, uh, and so the cutoffs that we want to set to adjudicate a diagnostic mitral annulus disjunction and the imaging modalities. In, a, um, in a one study population, we see that the prevalence of the mitral annulus disjunction decreases in parallel with a higher uh, um, uh, cutoff to uh, adjudicate a diagnostic MAD and uh, uh, the prevalence of this condition uh, is also prone to um, the impact of uh, uh, imaging modality because uh, imaging modalities with higher spatial resolutions lead to uh, higher prevalences of mitral annulus disjunction. Because of it, uh, we have a very different uh, data regarding the prevalence of mitral annulus disjunction in patients with mitral valve prolapse. Another uh, thing that uh, we have to keep in mind is the site that we want to analyze to adjudicate the uh, presence of mitral annulus disjunction. Classically, this condition has been uh, assessed in the posterior, uh, in the posterior mitral wall, in the posterior wall uh, of the left ventricle, and so at the level of the P2 scallop of the posterior mitral leaflet. But this uh, uh, location uh, is um, characterized by the lowest prevalence of mitral annulus disjunction in consecutive patients. In contrast, we have uh, much higher prevalences of mitral annulus disjunction if uh, we look at different sites. And this, is, uh, uh, this can be explained if uh, we look at the anatomy, because the mitral annulus is in continuity with the fibrous structures that are the right and the left fibrous trigons. And these uh, fibrous trigons can expand to the mitral annulus. And so uh, in a normal subject, uh, uh, we in a normal subject, we can find some degree of disjunction. Uh, uh, at this level in continuity with uh, the fibrous trigon. 
but uh, this uh, uh, issue does not interest the posterior myo mitral annulus at the P2 level that is not uh, um, interested from this uh, uh, anatomical uh, normal variation. And so we usually do not find uh, uh, mitral annulus disjunction at this level. And because of this, if we look for mitral annulus disjunction at the level of P1 and P3 in normal hearts, we can find a mitral annulus disjunction of a very limited entity uh, in normal patients. And of course, this is a normal finding. But now we have to ask ourselves, so are all uh, mitral annulus disjunction in a three-chamber view really clinically relevant? Well, let's have a look at this uh, uh, practical case. This is a case of mitral annulus disjunction of small entity that we can detect with CMR, but that uh, we miss with transthoracic echocardiography. And this is a case of a true MAD, as uh, su suggested by the study group of Professor Faletra, because we found this anatomical abnormality in systole and in diastole. In contrast, according to Professor Faletra, some mitral annulus disjunctions are pseudomad because we do not see this abnormality during diastole, but only in systole. And this may be the result not of a disjunction, but only of a sliding of the posterior mitral leaflet on the left atrium during systole. But when we look at the clinical relevance of these uh, uh, definitions, uh, I don't think that uh, um, this is uh, um, so important and so distinctive. Let's uh, have a look at these two cases. The true MAD is uh, in a patient that is an healthy volunteer without ventricular arrhythmias and without myocardial fibrosis, and the pseudomad is uh, uh, in, uh, is present in this uh, patient with the history of ventricular arrhythmias and fibrosis at CMR. At the end, what uh, um, does uh, impact is uh, um, the effect of the uh, mitral annulus disjunction on the left ventricle. And this extensive mitral annulus disjunction will be uh, likely able to induce uh, higher uh, traction forces than this uh, very small mitral annulus disjunction. And uh, for the same reason, I don't think that mitral annulus disjunction is uh, a necessary condition to, uh, for sudden cardiac death in patients with mitral valve prolapse. Again, let's have a look at another example. Uh, on the left, uh, we, you can see the same uh, example than before of uh, a small uh, true mud in a healthy volunteer. And on the right, uh, you can see uh, a patient with uh, a leaflet mitral valve prolapse with thicker, thickened uh, mitral leaflet, significant mitral regurgitation, enlarged uh, left ventricle, but without uh, the uh, evidence of mitral annulus disjunction. However, this patient showed uh, a history of uh, ventricular arrhythmias and myocardial fibrosis because uh, overall, uh, all of these uh, features are responsible for increased uh, attraction forces of the left ventricle compared to the case on the left. So I think that uh, now we have uh, elements to uh, recognize uh, a benign mitral annulus disjunction that is uh, limited in extent uh, that uh, we may uh, see with CT and CMR, but not uh, with the transthoracic echocardiography, uh, mainly at the level of P1, P3, and is uh, uh, not associated with the abnormal motion of the uh, mitral valve and of the left ventricle, not associated with fibrosis, not associated with malignant sim symptoms, ECG alteration of or ventricular arrhythmias. In contrast, a malignant mitral annulus disjunction is great in terms of extent, can be detected by all imaging modalities, can be detected especially at the level of P2 scallop of the posterior mitral leaflet, and it is typically associated with abnormal motion of uh, uh, mitral valve apparatus and of the left ventricle, and is also associated with symptoms, ECG alterations, and uh, um, uh, ventricular ectopic beats. <laughs> 
And so Mitrolanus disjunction extent is only one piece of the puzzle. We have many different actors that can contribute to development of ventricular arrhythmias, such as genotype, uh, imbalance of uh, autonomic nervous system, Purkinje fib fibers disease, uh, and uh, uh, of course, uh, myocardial fibrosis. And because of it, uh, we um, um, will be likely able to improve the management of these patients with arrhythmic mitral valve prolapse and uh, mitral anus disjunction if uh, we improve our understandings on the mechanism of ventricular arrhythmias. But the future is just today, and we know that uh, as of today, we have more sensible uh, CMR imaging markers uh, for the detection of myocardial fibrosis that show a better correlation with mitral anus disjunction in comparison uh, to um, late gadolinium enhancement. And we also have uh, uh, imaging markers of uh, abnormal mechanical uh, uh, mechanism such as left ventricular strain that have been associated with ventricular arrhythmias in these patients. And with this regard, uh, we are back to the future because this is a very recent uh, publication in circulation cardiovascular imaging in which uh, uh, the authors found uh, for the first time a typical uh, uh, strain pattern in patients with mitral valve prolapse and disjunction in which we have a double peak pattern one peak just before the end systole and one peak just after the end systole. And this is because uh, uh, the normal uh, contraction uh, with the shortening of the left ventricle in these patients is uh, uh, early interrupted because of uh, the uh, mitral annulus disjunction and the abnormal expansion of the mitral annulus during systole that uh, provides uh, an opposite uh, uh, force in terms of direction to the left ventricle. And so it's responsible for a paradoxical lengthening of uh, uh, the uh, strain. And then after uh, the uh, closure of the aortic uh, valve and the drop of the uh, systolic pressure in uh, uh, the left ventricle, we have uh, uh, again a second peak because uh, uh, the um, uh, basal uh, myocardial wall completes uh, the contraction. And this pattern has been associated, not surprisingly, with uh, uh, fibrosis and with uh, uh, ventricular arrhythmias in patients with mitral valve prolapse and disjunction. So my conclusions regarding mitral annulus disjunction are that uh, mitral annulus disjunction can have uh, an impact uh, uh, for the development of ventricular arrhythmias, but uh, this is uh, an indirect role because uh, of uh, uh, inducing uh, traction on, on the left ventricle. And the left ventricle remains the key factor. And because of this, uh, mitral annulus disjunction presence per se is not malignant, especially when isolated uh, and small in terms of uh, extent. And uh, this uh, um, thing uh, reminds me of uh, uh, the story of uh, left ventricular non-compaction. There are no shortcuts for uh, complex uh, biology. There are no magic isolated tricks to predict, uh, su predict sudden cardiac death. But uh, uh, it is important to perform uh, uh, longitudinal studies to have uh, uh, significant uh, cutoffs uh, uh, for malignant uh, mitral annulus disjunction in, ter in terms of mitral annulus disjunction extent. However, the imaging uh, modality should be multimodality and should include uh, non imaging uh, parameters. And with the help of artificial intelligence, we may be able to develop one day a risk score for sudden cardiac death in these patients to improve our clinical practice. I make this main acknowledgement to Dr. Pier Giorgio Masci from King's College London. And I thank Professor Condorelli, Professor Francone, Dr. Monti and Dr. Bragato for the everyday support. And I thank you, you all for the attention and I saw, I'm sorry for the technical issues at the beginning of my presentation. Thank you so much. That was a, a, a wonderful lecture uh, and in a very, very complex topic. Let me close that. Uh...
Okay, so I'm sure there's going to be quite a few questions. Uh, please put the questions in the in the Q and A, and and we'll go through them. So uh, you can also see the the code for CME if you if you want to use CME, you'll see it there in the in the in the screen. So first question. So uh, it says from clinical, the uh, comment on papillary muscle apical displacement. Is it just secondary to LV remodeling due to severe MR or a primary low insertion of the papillary muscle? Oh. Well, this is a very good question. Um, I mean, uh, uh, of course, in uh, when, uh, when it comes to the myocardial fibrosis, we know that it comes the enlargement of the left ventricle because of the mitral valve prolapse related um, cardiomyopathy. And this is uh, uh, triggered uh, by the disjunction itself. And it's, uh, um, I mean, uh, triggered by uh, the mitral regurgitation as well. So of course, in patients with uh, very enlarged uh, left uh, ventricular uh, uh, left ventricles, we have uh, a secondary uh, displacement of the papillary muscles. However, um, there may also be, uh, um, uh, let's say, congenital uh, factor in patients uh, that uh, uh, do not display uh, significant enlargement of the left ventricle, do not display significant mitral uh, regurgitation, and this prim primative, uh, primary um, uh, abnormality of the papillary muscles leads to uh, higher traction forces on the uh, papillary muscle itself, and so to the development of myocardial fibrosis. So at the end of the day, we have a, a vicious circle. We don't know what comes before, according to our data in the literature, but we know that uh, in uh, end-stage uh, uh, conditions, uh, um, we have a, a, a vicious uh, cycle. Thank you so much. Very interesting. So we have a, a question from Carl Sties, one of our research heart failure fellows. He says, is there any correlation between syndromic hereditary thoracic aneurysms versus non-syndromic and genetic uh, versus non-genetics with the imaging risk factors that you mentioned uh, and or adverse events that we can use to improve prediction? This is a very brilliant question. Uh, so we know that uh, mitral valve prolapse uh, is uh, a form of fruste of uh, Marfan syndrome. And there is a very brilliant study published in JAMA in 1989 that demonstrates that patients with isolated mitral valve prolapse have uh, uh, enlarged uh, aortic diameters compared to normal subject, but they are not so enlarged as Marfan disease patients. So uh, at the end of the day, we have a connective tissue disorder and we have, uh, even if limited, we have evidences that uh, these uh, um, abnormalities in connective tissue disease reflects an enlargement of the aorta in patients with the mitral valve prolapse. These abnormalities are more pronounced in syndromic uh, uh, mitral valve prolapse conditions such as uh, loose teeth and Marfan syndromes. And uh, uh, it is also remarkable to say that one study uh, from Civil Civulesco uh, has uh, associated the presence of mitral anus disjunction with uh, uh, aortic uh, uh, outcomes, uh, um, so with uh, um, uh, outcomes related to uh, acute aortic syndromes. The presence of my, at mitral anus disjunction was able to predict it, but this finding uh, um, was not confirmed by um, a study published in the same year in JAMA Cardiology. So I think there is a, a room for research to establish a prognostic significance for aortic syndrome in patients uh, with uh, Marfan syndrome and mitral anus disjunction. Thank you very much. We have a question from our chief of cardiology, Mario Garcia. Thank you for a very comprehensive presentation. He says, you describe diagnosis by several imaging modalities. They have different differences in spatial and temporal resolution. Which one would you consider a reference standard? 
Oh, this is uh, the question, <laughs> because uh, uh, thanks a lot. But uh, I think that we need studies. We don't have uh, studies with uh, multimodality imaging assessment of mitral anus disjunction and longitudinal follow-up. I think that uh, there has been it, it has been uh, proposed that CMR is uh, the main uh, uh, imaging modality to diagnose mitral anus disjunction. I think that CMR is a central uh, for the uh, assessment of these patients because of the comprehensive assessment, fibrosis uh, and the left ventricular volumes, et cetera. But uh, for the diagnosis of mitral anus disjunction, as uh, uh, we saw in our case that was present in CMR, but not with TT, we have, we have the risk to be too sensible. And uh, the more we see, the less we know. Uh, if we have a very limited mitral anus disjunction that uh, are uh, evident uh, on CMR and on TT, I don't think that uh, they are uh, uh, pathological. So we need uh, longitudinal studies with uh, uh, multimodality imaging assessment to have uh, uh, imaging specific uh, uh, cutoffs for clinical relevant mitral anus disjunction, in my opinion. At the end of the day, as of today, we have to deal with the transthoracic uh, echocardiography, that is the first uh, uh, level examination. And we have also always to report uh, the extent of the mitral anus disjunction that has to be measured in the parasternal long axis view or in the three chamber view, because we have evidence on the uh, on this methodology as associated with the ventricular arrhythmias at, uh, at least. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'll, I'll ask you a question. So you, you, you answered part of it already. So in two parts. So when you report an echo or, or, a, or a CMR, uh, what features do you include in your report? And, and the second part is, what is your recommendation? Is your recommendation at any point to do an ICD? Oh. Well, thanks a lot, Leandro. This is a very difficult question, so the, the second one, I mean. But uh, I mean, let's start with the, the simplest one. Uh, when uh, I report uh, uh, CMR in a patient with mitral annulus disjunction or mitral valve prolapse, uh, let's say it's a common spectrum, I always uh, measure uh, mitral annulus disjunction in systole, and uh, I always uh, uh, give uh, uh, an extent uh, um, a number of millimeters during uh, uh, systole, the highest uh, extent of the mitral annulus disjunction. Uh, moreover, uh, I consider the uh, mitral annulus disjunction extent outside of the uh, assessment of the mitral valve prolapse. Otherwise, uh, all patients with uh, a degree of disjunction of at least two millimeters will uh, have also mitral valve prolapse. And uh, um, so these uh, are my recommendations for uh, patients with uh, mitral annulus disjunction. And um, uh, regarding the Second question was about uh, the, um, was about. Would you ever recommend, do you think there's any evidence to, to do ICD for these patients or do you require other things before they have sudden cardiac death? So, uh, so uh, the, according to our uh, um, uh, clinical recommendation, uh, we only have uh, evidence to, I mean, uh, increase uh, uh, the alert of attention in these patients uh, and to be, I mean, uh, um, uh, to be responsible for uh, a more frequent monitoring with the ECG alter of, uh, or uh, um, implantation of uh, um, ECG recording systems. But we do not uh, have a recommendation for ICD. So I think that uh, uh, clinical and ECG findings are very important. So if uh, I have patients with syncope and ventricular arrhythmias, especially right mandal branch block, eventually polymorphic, uh, polymorphic ventricular arrhythmias with the alternating axis that has been associated with the adverse outcomes and the very extended mitral anus disjunction, let's say more than uh, eight millimeters, and uh, if you clearly see the systolic curling with distress on the left ventricle and you also have uh, myocardial fibrosis, uh, I think that uh, um, it's important to talk with the patients to explain that we do not have evidence for ICD, but we may consider it. Um, I think uh, uh, for the same reason that CMR is very important uh, uh, today, because uh, if we exclude extended mitral anulus disjunction, and if we exclude the myocardial fibrosis, we can reassure patients with mitral valve prolapse and disjunction because of a benign condition. Thank you very much. And that's, uh, I think you 
you answer all, all the points uh, of, of my question. Uh, so, and we have Andrea Scotti that I think he knows you as the last question. He said, Ciao Stefano, such a pleasure to see you here. He says, uh, in the absence of significant clinical events, how would you follow these patients? You said some things, you said ILR, you said uh, uh, closer follow-up. Any, anything else you would recommend? Ciao, Andrea. <laughs> Such a pleasure to meet you uh, here. But uh, no, I mean, uh, as just before, let's be guided by, by uh, the clinical features of patients. Uh, so uh, we may uh, perform the ECG alter monitoring uh, uh, every six months uh, if uh, we want to be, uh, I mean, uh, um, quite sure uh, that uh, we want to follow patients. It's important uh, always to perform the 12 lead ECG altering monitoring because of the morphology of the ventricular ectopy beats has been associated with arrhythmic mitral valve prolapse. We have to find ventricular ectopy beats in, at alter monitoring originating from papillary muscles, Purkinje fibers, or from uh, the basal uh, posterior myocardial wall. And uh, if so, if so, uh, we can uh, um, we can be guided uh, from uh, um, I mean uh, clinical findings. At the end of the day, we have to be um, I mean uh, we have to know that mitral valve prolapse is a very common condition. Three percent of the general population. Many cases of mitral valve prolapse have ventricular arrhythmias because of the prolapse, because of this induction, this uh, because of this mechanical induction. So we do not have to be scared uh, when we see ventricular arrhythmias. It's very difficult to, to see patients with uh, highest risk, but uh, let's say ECG, repolarization abnormalities, CMR findings and uh, um, clinical uh, uh, aspects uh, will guide uh, our uh, um, clinical management. And we, we got one last one, and uh, we finished with this one from Nicola Tarantino as well. Uh, so he says, and you, you partially answered this before, is the MAD reversible after surgical repair? And you mentioned about fibrosis. Is there any time that is reversible and we change the risk and any time we don't? Yes, yes, uh, yes, Leandro, it is correct. Uh, mitral anosis junction is reversible with uh, uh, surgical repair. Uh, it is reversible with uh, annuloplasty. So, um, and uh, uh, the presence of mitral anosis junction has not been associated with um, uh, complications uh, after uh, mitral surgery regarding uh, uh, mitral regurgitation. So it, it is completely um, feasible. Uh, it, it's, it's feasible to repair mitral anonymous disjunction. It's not complex. Uh, the main question is, is uh, if uh, the mitral valve surgery can reduce uh, uh, the ventricular ectopy beats uh, burden uh, and uh, uh, the uh, sudden cardiac death in these patients. Uh, of course, this is another big uh, point uh, that uh, um, we don't know and uh, uh, we need studies uh, on uh, on this because we don't we only have uh, anecdotal uh, case reports that are uh, in contrast one to each other. Okay, so thank you very much. That was wonderful. Thank you for the patience with the technical difficulties at the beginning, and hopefully we'll see you in New York sometime soon. Hopefully, yes. I want to thank you for your amazing uh, support with the technical part. You were really on the track. You make, I mean, uh, you make me feel uh, comfortable and uh, uh, it was not easy. So thanks a lot for your uh, support. Uh, amazing one. Thanks a lot, Leanne. Thanks a lot. Okay. Take care. Have a good weekend. And you too. Bye.